Welcome back to the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. We're going to take a look at Ethereum transactions, uh, our next lecture in Understanding Ethereum. Uh, just a reminder that um, this video and the slides and all the materials are available in our Creative Commons uh, license, um, and that this presentation includes content from the Mastering Ethereum GitHub site by Andreas and Gavin. I'd like to thank Andreas and Gavin and the other GitHub contributors for making their content available under the license. Uh, and just a reminder, these materials are not investment advice or legal advice. They're for educational purposes only. I'm not endorsing any particular uh, blockchain projects. All right, so what's our agenda? We're diving into Ethereum transactions. So we'll introduce uh, what's going on with transactions in Ethereum. We'll take a look at the structure of Ethereum transactions. We'll talk about uh, what's going on in creating a contract as a transaction. We'll look at digital signatures. We'll look at offline signing of transactions. We'll look at trans transactions being sent across the blockchain. We'll look at recording them on the blockchain. And finally, we'll look at multiple signature transactions or multi-sig transactions. Um, a lot of this material is somewhat similar to the way transactions are handled in Bitcoin, but there are some significant differences from Bitcoin. Um, you know, because obviously all the founders of Ethereum were very familiar with Bitcoin, so they wanted to take the best parts of Bitcoin when they created Ethereum, but they also wanted to make improvements and changes uh, to, um, you know, meet their own objectives. And so let's take a look at how Ethereum handles transactions. So what are transactions? Transactions are signed messages originated by an externally owned account in Ethereum transmitted by the Ethereum network and recorded on the Ethereum blockchain. So remember these externally owned accounts are essentially users, a user who's got a private key and a public key and they're using and, and then they can use that private key to create digital signatures. So a user who's got this uh, key pair can create a transaction by signing the message. Uh, this basic definition conceals a lot of uh, details. Another way to look at transactions is that transactions are the only things that can trigger a change of state or cause a smart contract to execute in the Ethereum virtual machine. Uh, remember, Ethereum is a global singleton state machine and transactions are what make this state machine work uh, because a transaction is changing the state of the, of the state machine. Contracts uh, can't start on their own. They need a contract. They need a transaction to start the contract in doing something. You know, Ethereum doesn't run autonomously on its own, uh, like an artificial intelligence environment. Instead, everything starts with a, a transaction. So in this lecture, we're going to dive through transactions, show how they work, and examine the details. Now, a lot of what's in this lecture is addressed to those who are interested in understanding how transactions work at a low level. Keep in mind that in many cases, you'll be using an Ethereum wallet or a client app to interact with the transactions. So you don't actually have to know these details if you're just using the wallet or another client app. So let's take a look at the basic structure of a transaction. Uh, remember, these transactions are going to be serialized and then transmitted on the Ethereum network. Um, each Ethereum client and application that receives one of these serialized transactions will store it in memory and using its own internal data structure, uh, perhaps, you know, with some metadata that doesn't exist in the transaction itself. Um, the network serialization approach is the only standard form of a transaction. So a transaction is essentially a serialized binary message that contains the following data. Um, we've got a nonce, a gas price, a gas limit, a recipient, a value, a data, and then your digital signature components of ERS. So the nonce is essentially a sequence number uh, issued by the originating uh, user, the, uh, the, uh, the externally owned account, um, and that's used to prevent uh, message replay. Uh, on the transit so that a hacker can't, you know, do a replay attack. The gas price is the amount of ether uh, counted in way, which is the smallest amount of ether, um, that the originator of the transaction is willing to pay for each unit of gas. The gas limit is the maximum amount of gas the originator is willing to uh, pay for this transaction. The recipient is the destination Ethereum address. Um, you know, where are we sending this transaction to? 
Uh, the value is the amount of ether that's sent to the recipient. Um, again, we're counting from ways. Um, and then the data is uh, if you're sending a data payload along with it. And then we have our elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, which sends along some components, which we're going to use is call VRS. The uh, transactions message structure is serialized using a recursive length prefix, uh, sometimes referred to as RLP, uh, as an encoding scheme. This was cr created specifically for uh, simple byte serialization in Ethereum. All numbers in Ethereum are encoded as big endian integers of lengths that are multiples of eight bits. The field labels, like the gas limit and set and so on, um are shown here for clarity but they're not actually uh part of the transaction serialized data which essentially is encoding the field values in rlp in general rlp does not contain any field delimiters or labels rlp's length prefix is used to identify the length of each field anything beyond the defined length is going to belong to the next field in the data structure Now, some of the information is actually derived because it's not explicitly part of the transaction, but it can be derived from the transaction. So for example, there's no from data in the address identifying the originator's um, externally owned account. The address can be derived from the public key. So when you see a transaction showing a from field, that was added by the software used to visualize the transaction. Other metadata frequently added to the transaction by client software uh, might be the block number once it's once that block is mined and included in the blockchain and a transaction ID, which is you know essentially a calculated hash of the transaction. Again, that data is derived from the transaction, doesn't form part of the transaction message itself. Now, here's a comment on the transaction nonce. The nonce is an important and hard, hard to understand component of an Ethereum transaction. The definition in the Ethereum yellow paper says, not a, a scalar value equal to the number of transactions sent from this address, or in the case of accounts with associated code, the number of contract creations made by this account. So strictly speaking, the nonce is an attribute of the originating uh, address. That is, it only has meaning in the context of the sending address. However, the nonce is not stored explicitly as part of an account state on the blockchain. Instead, it is calculated dynamically by counting the number of confirmed transactions that have originated from the address. There are two scenarios where uh, the existence of a transaction uh, counting nonce is important. The usability feature of transactions being included in the order of creation and the feature of transaction duplication protection. So let's take a look at some examples. Um, imagine uh, the first one we'll take a look at is the order of creation. So imagine that um, you want to make two transactions. You have a payment to make of six Ether and another payment to make of eight Ether. So you sign and broadcast the six Ether transaction first, and then you sign and broadcast the second eight Ether transaction. However, let's suppose that your account only contained 10 Ether. So the network can't accept both transactions. One of them is going to go through, and then when you attempt the other one, you'll get an insufficient balance error. Because you sent the six Ether one first, you expect that one to go through and the eight ether one to be rejected once you find out that your balance is insufficient. However, in a decentralized system like Ethereum, nodes may receive the transaction in either order. There's no guarantee that a particular node will have one transaction sent to it before the other. Therefore, it could be the case that some nodes will receive the six ether transaction first and others will receive the eight ether transaction first. Without a nonce, it would be random as to which one gets accepted and which rejected. However, with the nonce included, the first transaction you sent will have a nonce of say, let's three. Well, the eight ether transaction will have a nonce value of four. 
Uh, so it essentially becomes like a priority value saying, hey, this is the, uh, well, we're going to take and process the, e the three Ether transaction. The, I mean, the, uh, the transaction number three first, and then if there's sufficient Ether, then we'll process transaction number four. Um, even if the transactions are received out of order. All right, so that's our first example. The second example is uh, avoiding duplicate transactions. So imagine again, in, uh, in this case, you've got an account for 100 Ether. Uh, you find someone online who's willing to accept payment uh, for something you wanna buy. You send them to Ether and they're gonna send you the item you're interested in. However, to make that to Ether payment, you sign a transaction into Ether from your account to their account. And then you broadcast it to the Ethereum network to be verified and included in the, on the blockchain. Now, without a nonce value in the transaction, a second transaction sending two Ether to the same address a second time will look exactly the same as the first transaction. This means that anyone who sees your transaction on the Ether net, Ethereum network, which means everyone, including the recipient of your enemies, could replay the transaction again and again until all your Ether is gone, simply by copying and pasting your original transaction and resend it to the network. However, with the nonce value included in the transaction data, every single transaction is unique, even when sending the same amount of Ether to the same recipient address multiple times. Therefore, by having an incrementing nonce as part of the transaction, it's not gonna be possible for someone to duplicate a payment you've made. So it's important to note that the use of nonce is actually really important for an account-based protocol in, uh, like Ethereum uh, in contrast to Bitcoin's approach using unspent transaction outputs. So in practical terms, the nonce is an up-to-date count of the number of confirmed, i.e. on-chain transactions that have originated from an account. To find out what the nonce is, you can um, send a message to the blockchain, for, uh, for example, via a Web3 interface. You can open a JavaScript uh, console in Geth or another Web3 interface uh, and then type in uh, you know, a request, like the request we show here, uh, Web3 is get, get Get transaction count and then they're passing in a particular address and they get back a response. Uh, the nonce is a zero base counter so the very first transaction will have not zero. Uh, so in, and for example um, if we're let's imagine when we do this uh, web3 if get transaction count uh, request uh, we're hitting a address that's done 40 transactions meaning that nonces zero through 39 have been seen. The next transaction is announced, which will be the 41st one, will actually have a counter of 40. So while sending a new transaction with a pending transaction or sending a few transactions consecutive, consecutively, the wallet software needs to process it pretty carefully. Um, If you're using Parity's JSON RPC interface, it uses a function called Parity Next Nonce, which is going to tell you which uh, nonce to use in a particular transaction. Um, now, what happens if you make a mistake? Let's suppose, for example, um, that you transmit a transaction with nonce zero, you know, it's the first uh, transaction, and then you transmit a transaction with nonce two, which is actually our third transaction, because again, we're counting from zero. Well, if you haven't sent out the second transaction yet, um, we're not going to be able to include transaction three yet. It's just going to be stored in the mempool until transaction number two is, is in broadcast. And then once that missing nonce one transaction, which is actually our second transaction is broadcast, it will be processed and then we'll go ahead and process transaction three. So a transaction can create an invert, uh, a gap in the nonce sequence because that transaction is invalid and it failed or it had insufficient gas. And so to get things moving again, what you would do is you would transmit a valid transaction with the missing nonce. Um, and you should be mindful that once a transaction with the missing nonce is validated by the network, all the transactions with the subsequent nonces will then uh, be processed and hopefully become valid. Um,
Now, if you accidentally duplicate a nonce, for example, by transmitting two transactions with the same nonce by different recipients or values, then one's going to be confirmed and one will be rejected. You might ask, how could you do that? Well, let's suppose you've got multiple clients that are um, handling you know, the same uh, address. In that case, you could actually do that. So which transaction is confirmed is going to be determined by the sequence in which they arrive at the first validating node that receives them. I, it's going to be fairly random. As you can see, keeping track of nonce is, is necessary uh, so that for your wallets and clients. And if, if an application doesn't manage the nonce process, process correctly, uh, your application can run into problems. Now, again, this is something that is pretty much handled by the people who build wallets and Ethereum clients. It's not something you have to worry about unless you're actually in the business of building wallets or clients. But it's helpful to understand why we have that nonce in our transaction structure. So let's talk about concurrency. Concurrency is a complex aspect of computer science and it um, ha can have some unexpected outcomes, especially in decentralized and distributed real-time systems like Ethereum. In simple terms, concurrency is when you have simultaneous computation by multiple systems. They can be in the same program, like multiple threads in a program. They can be in the same uh, CPU, like multiple processing. It could be on different computers, like distributed computers. Ethereum, by definition, is a system that allows concurrency of operations. Um, you know, we've got multiple nodes all processing the Ethereum virtual machine. Uh, and through consensus, we hope to arrive at the same singleton state on all of those nodes. Now, if you've got multiple independent wallet applications that are generated transactions from the same address or addresses, um, you can run into some errors. One example of such a situation would be an exchange processing withdrawals from an exchange hot wallet, a wallet whose keys are stored online, in contrast to a cold wallet where the keys are never out stored online. Uh, so for you might have more than one computer processing withdrawals so that a single computer doesn't become a bottleneck or a single point of failure. However, this quickly becomes a problem as having more than one computer producing withdrawals can result in concurrency problems. Um, you know, not least of which is the selection of nonces. Um, so you might ask yourself, well, what kind of concurrency problem can come up with if we're doing, if we're having multiple computers producing withdrawals? Well, just imagine the, the ATM scenario where you've got a married couple uh, who both want to withdraw money from an account at the same time. If there's, say, for example, $100 in the account and each person wants, each spouse wants to pull out $60 and they're across town from each other and not communicating, um, how does the bank handle and validate which with withdrawal is going to be permitted and which one is not? Well, that's the sort of concurrency problem that Ethereum has to deal with. You know, what happens when multiple computers generate, sign, and broadcast transactions from the same wallet address? Uh, you could use a single computer to assign the nonces on a first come, first serve basis to computers signing transactions. However, that single computer then becomes a single point of failure. Now you're saying that that's the only computer that can be involved in the withdrawals. Uh, worse, if several nonces are assigned and one of them never gets used because of failure in, in this, the application, all the subsequent transactions get stuck uh, until that nonce is used. Another approach would be to generate the transactions, but not assign a nonce to them, and therefore leave them unsigned. Remember that the nonce is a integral part of the transaction data and therefore needs to be included in the digital signature uh, that uh, authenticates the transaction. So, and then you could queue the uh, the, the uh, transaction to a single node that uh, is will perform the digital signature and keep track of the nonces. However, this is also going to uh, have some problems. Uh, it's a choke point in the process. You know, the signing and tracking of nonces is, is a part of your operation is likely to become congested under load. And so the generation of the unsigned transactions part is a part you really don't need to paralyze. 
um, you would have some concurrency would be lacking in, in a critical part of the process. In the end, these concurrency problems on top of the difficulty of tracking account balances and tracking confirmations and independent processes force most implementations towards avoiding concurrency and results in bottlenecks such as a single process handling all the withdrawal transactions in exchange or setting up multiple hot, hot wallets that can work completely independently for withdrawals and only need to be intermittently rebalanced. Uh, what's and so the, you know it's an architectural feature of Ethereum applications that you should be aware of if you're architecting your own Ethereum application. Let's talk about transactions and gas. Um, I've talked a little bit about uh, Ethereum's use of gas to pay for transactions in previous uh, presentations. Uh, remember, gas is sort of like a, a Bitcoin's uh, transaction fees. Um, gas is what we're going to use to pay for running the smart contracts on the Ethereum virtual machine. Just as in Bitcoin, they use transaction fees to pay for the processing of the transactions uh, to produce the decentralized consensus. However, let's cover some basics about how this works, because gas works a little bit differently than uh, transaction fees in Bitcoin. So first of all, you can think of gas as really being the fuel that runs the Ethereum virtual machine. It's not really Ether. Uh, we pay for it with Ether, but gas is essentially a separate virtual currency with its own exchange rate against Ether. Um, Ethereum uses gas to control the amount of resources that a transaction can use. So Ethereum uses gas to control the number of resources a transaction can use. Since we're gonna be running these transactions in parallel on thousands of computers around the world. Um, the open-ended uh, computation model, which we'll refer to as Turing complete, requires some form of metering in order to make sure that all of these thousands of systems uh, aren't gonna fall into an infinite loop or, be the subject of a denial of service attack or otherwise inadvertently devour too many resources. Uh, gas is separate from ether in order to protect the system from the volatility that might arise along with rapid changes in the value of ether and also as a way to manage the important sensitive ratios between the cost of the various resources that gas pays for, namely computation, memory, and storage. Now, of course, there's been a lot of controversy in gas over the last year or two with the prices being highly volatile. Um, there recently was a change to how gas functions uh, and, and uh, there will be more changes in the future. Uh, so let's talk about the gas price field. The gas price field in a transaction allows the transaction originator to set the price they're willing to pay in exchange for gas. The price is measured in way uh, per gas unit for example, in a sample transaction, uh, your wallet set the uh, gas price to three uh, gigaway or three billion way. The popular site East Gas Station provides information on the current prices of gas and other relevant gas metrics for the Ethereum uh, main network. So let's talk about gas price and priority. The higher the gas price, the faster the transaction is likely to be confirmed. So wallets can adjust the gas price of transactions to achieve faster confirmations. Um, a lower priority transaction can carry a reduced gas price resulting in slower confirmations, but saving money. The minimum price that gas price can be set to is zero, which would be a fee-free transaction. Uh, doing, during periods of low demand for space in a block, such a transaction might very well get mined. Um, depending on capacity, however, a zero fee transaction might never go through the blockchain, but there is nothing in the protocol that prohibits creating a free transaction. You can find several examples of such transactions that were successfully included on the Ethereum blockchain. The uh, Web3 interface uh, will offer a gas price suggestion by calculating a median price across several blocks. You can use a Truffle console or any JavaScript Web3 console to do that uh, using the code I'm showing here on the screen. This Web3 ETH get gas price. And let me know what the gas price is. The second important uh, field related to gas prices is gas limit. 
Uh, in simple terms, the gas limit gives the maximum number of units of gas the transaction originator is willing to buy in order to complete the transaction. For simple payments, this means uh, transactions that transfer ether from one and uh, externally owned account to another externally owned account. Uh, the gas amount needed is fixed at 21,000 uh, gas units. To calculate how much ether that will cost, you multiply 21,000 by the gas price you're willing to pay. So for example, here we see, you know, we're getting the gas price and we'll multiply it by 21,000. Uh, if your transaction's destination, destination address is a contract, then the amount of gas needed can be estimated, but it can't be determined with accuracy. That's because a smart contract can evaluate different conditions that lead to different execution paths with different total gas costs. The contract may execute only a single computation or a far more complicated computation with lots of computations included within it, uh, depending on conditions that are outside of your control and can't be predicted. Um, you know, it's possible for one contract to consume gas for 10 different requests uh, or even more. So for example, let's suppose that you had a contract, a smart contract that increments a counter each time it's called and executes a particular loop a number of times equal to the call count. Uh, maybe then on the hundredth call, it gives out a special prize like a lottery, but needs to do additional computations to calculate the prize. If you call the contract 99 times, one thing will happen, but on the hundredth call, something else completely different happens. The amount of gas you're gonna pen for is gonna depend on how many other transactions have called that function before your transactions including the block. Perhaps your estimate is, is based on being the 99th transaction, but just before you, someone else called it, and now you're the hundredth transaction and your computation effort is gonna be much higher. Uh, so you can think of gas limit as the capacity of the fuel tank fuel tank in your car with your car being the transaction you fill the tank with as much gas as you think it will need for the journey the computation needed to validate your tra your transaction you can estimate the amount to some degree but there might be unexpected changes to your journey such as a diversion a more complicated execution path that'll increase your fuel consumption uh, the analogy to the fuel temp tank is somewhat misleading it it's more like a credit account for a gas station company where you pay after the trip is completed depending on how much gas you actually used. When you transmit your transaction, one of the first validation steps is to check that the amount, the account it originated from has enough ether to pay the gas price times the gas limit. The amount is not actually deducted from your account until the transaction finishes executing. You're only billed for the gas actually consumed by your transaction, but you have to have enough balance for the maximum amount you're willing to pay before you send in your transaction. So for example, if you think your transaction might cost anywhere between 10 and $30, you should put in at least $30 for your maximum amount so that the transaction will run no matter where it is in that range. So let's take a look at uh, transaction recipients. Uh, the recipient of a transaction is specified in the two field. This contains a 20 byte Ethereum address. The address can be an externally owned account or a contract address, as we mentioned earlier. Ethereum does no further validation in that field. Uh, any 20 byte value is gonna be considered valid whether or not there, that address actually exists. If the 20 byte value corresponds to an address without a corresponding private key or without a corresponding smart contract, the transaction's still valid, but no one's gonna be able to use that Ethereum. Ethereum has no way of knowing whether an address was correctly derived from a public key and, and therefore originally from a private key. So the Ethereum protocol isn't gonna validate recipient addresses and transactions. You can send to an address that has no corresponding private key or contract. And essentially this results in what we call burning the Ethereum, renting it forever unspendable since no one knows how to unlock it. Um, although it's not actually forever unspendable, it's just, practically forever uh, because as uh, you know quantum computers become a reality they may result in the ability to figure out how to access some of this uh, quote burnt ether unquote uh, validation should be done at the user interface level before you send your uh, your message to verify you're sending it to the correct address so you don't lose your ether 
Um, so sending the transaction to the wrong address, as I mentioned, probably burns the ether, rendering it inaccessible. Um, there are a number of valid reasons, however, why someone might want to burn ether um, as a disincentive to cheating in payment channels and other smart contracts. And since the amount of ether is finite, burning ether effectively distributes the value burned to all ether holders. You know, for example, if there's 100 Ethereum out there in the world and each Ethereum is worth a dollar, if one of those Ethereum no longer exists and now there's 99 Ether, uh, well, then that $100 value is now split across 99 Ether. So every Ether is now worth a dollar and a penny as opposed to just being worth a dollar. It's essentially deflationary in that as Ether is burned, the remaining Ether becomes more valuable. Um, that's part of the theory that was going beyond some of the recent changes to gas price, which we'll talk about at another time. So let's talk about transaction value and the data payload. So the main payload of a transaction is contained in two fields, the value field and the data field. Transactions can have both or, um, or one of each or neither. Um, so all four possible combinations, you could have a transaction with an only a value. So that's essentially a payment. A transaction with only data is essentially an invocation. We're sending data to a contract. Uh, a transaction with both value and data is both a payment and an invocation. And a transaction with neither value nor data is essentially probably just a waste of gas, but it's still possible. So let's take a look at some examples. So here we have a transaction with only value. So we're going to set our source and destination addresses from an Ethereum wallet just to make the demo demonstration easier to read. So here we're setting up uh, some uh, Web3 ETH accounts uh, with our source being zero and a destination being one. And our first transaction contains only a payment and no data uh, payload. So we're basically just sending um, a payment from the source to the destination. And our payment, if you look in here in parentheses, is going to be 0.01 Ether. And then our data is going to be the open shut quotes to show there's no data being passed. And here we see, uh, looking at a parity wallet, uh, we see a confirmation screen, screen indicating the value to send. We're going to transfer 0.01 ETH to our second MetaMask account. It shows us a gas and it's going to go ahead and send the transaction and wants you to confirm that yes, you will, you want to say it, send it. All right. Uh, let's now let's take an example of set, specifying both a uh, uh, value of ETH to send and a data payload. And again, we're going to use the uh, the parity wallet. So now we've got our parity wallet showing a confirmation screen indicating, yeah, we're sending 0.01 ETH to MetaMask account number two. And we've got some data payload, a zero times one, two, three, four. Um, and then we show the gas that's required. And then it asks you if you want to confirm to send that message. Um, now we're going to show sending a data payload, but not sending any Ethereum. So we're, again, we're sending a transaction from source to the destination with a, a ETH value of zero. We're still sending this data one, two, three, four. So now if we look at our parity, our wallet in parity, it shows us we're transferring zero ETH to MetaMask account number two, but and we still we are sending some data, zero, one, two, three, four. Do, do you want to confirm it or reject it? Um, finally, here's a transaction with no value or data being sent from the, uh, the sender to the destination. So our value for ETH is zero and our data is um, nothing. Uh, we're showing the message, we're signing it, we're sending it off to MetaMask account number two. You don't, you just see zero ETH, you don't see any data. You still have to pay gas to do this. Still pays almost the same amount of gas, 940 gas. Um, so it's, you're basically wasting money since you're not sending them any money or sending them any data, but you can do it if you want to. So let's talk about transmitting value uh, to externally owned accounts and to smart contracts. When you construct an Ethereum transaction that contains a value, it's the equivalent of a payment. You know, this transaction that's sent in a payment somewhere. Such transactions behave differently depending on whether the destination address is a smart contract or not. 
Uh, for externally owned account addresses or, or for any address that isn't flagged as a contract on the blockchain, Ethereum is going to record a state change, adding the value sent to the balance of the address. If the address has not been seen before, um, that address is going to be added to the client's internal representation of the uh, Ethereum state, and that address's balance is initialized to the value of your payment. If the destination address is a smart contract, then the Ethereum virtual machine is going to execute the contract and will attempt to call the function named in the data payload of your transaction. If there is no data in your transaction, the Ethereum virtual machine will call a fallback function, which is basically a function that's called when you don't specify the, the function you're calling. And if that fallback function is payable, it will execute it to determine what to do next. If there is no code in the fallback function, then the effect of the transaction will be to increase the balance of the contract, exactly like a payment to a wallet. If there is no fallback function or no or a non-payable fallback function, then the transaction is going to be reverted. A contract can reject incoming payments by throwing an exception immediately when a function is called or is determined by conditions coded in a function. If the function terminates successfully without an exception, then the contract state is updated to reflect an increase in the contract's ether balance. When your transaction contains data, then it is most likely being sent, that transaction is most likely being sent to a contract address where that contract is gonna do something with the data. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't send a data payload to an externally owned address. That is completely valid in the Ethereum protocol. However, in that case, the interpretation of the data is up to the wallet you use to access the externally owned address. Um, most wallets will ignore any data received in an address in a transaction to an externally owned address they control. Uh, in the future, it's possible that standards may emerge that allow wallets to interpret data the way contracts do, thereby allowing transactions to invoke functions running inside user wallets. The difference is that any interpretation of the data payload by an externally owned address is not subject to Ethereum's consensus rules, unlike a contract execution. Um, you know, think about that for a minute. What we're saying is that, um, you know, if you're sending data to the Ethereum virtual machine to be processed by a contract, then we want all, all of the various machines that are running the uh, Ethereum virtual machine to achieve consensus and arrive at the single result as part of this global singleton. However, when you send data to a wallet, that wallet is actually not part of the EVM and you know, you're off chain at that point. And so what that wallet does with the data is really up to the, how the wallet's designed. It's not part of Ethereum's consensus rules at that point because your data is essentially left the chain. So let's assume that your transaction is delivering data to a contract address. In that case, uh, the data is going to be interpreted by the Ethereum virtual machine as a contract invocation. Uh, most contracts use this data as essentially a function invocation, calling the name function and passing any encoded arguments to that particular function. Uh, the data payload um, is going to be sent to um, an ABI compatible contract, which we'll talk about in more detail when we talk about contracts in greater detail. But you can, for, for all purposes, you can assume all contracts are ABI compatible. And the data payload is going to be a sex as a, is going to be a hex in serialized encoding of um, several arguments. It's going to have a function selector, uh, which is the first four bytes of the hash of the function's prototype. This allows a contract to unambiguously identify which function you're calling. Um, and then it's going to have the function arguments encoded according to the rules for the various data types uh, defined in the ABI specification. One special case that we should mention is a transaction that creates a new contract on the blockchain deploying it for future use. 
contract creation transactions are sent to a special destination address called the zero address. The two field in the contract registration transaction contains the address zero by zero. Uh, this address represents neither an externally owned address, there's no corresponding public or private key pair, nor a smart contract. Uh, that address zero by zero can never spend ether or initiate a transaction. It is only used as a destination with a special meaning create this contract. While the zero address is intended only for contract creation, it sometimes receives payments. There are two explanations for this. Either it's by accident, uh, resulting in the use of ether, or it's an intentional burn of the ether, deliberately destroying the ether by sending it to an address from which it can never be spent. However, if you want to do an intentional ether burn, you should make your intention clear to the network and actually use a specially designated uh, burn address which we're showing here, it's zero times a whole bunch of zeros and then ends with uh, the DEAD for dead. Uh, any ether sent to the designated burn address will become unspendable and be lost forever or in you know until there is a time when someone figures out how to recover ether from that address, which is not likely to happen anytime soon. A contract creation need only contain a data payload that contains a compiled bytecode, which will create the contract. The only effect of this transaction is to create the contract. You can include an ether amount in the value field if you want to set the new contract up with starting balance, but that is entirely optional. If you send a value of ether to the contract creation address without a data payload, uh, then the effect is the same as sending to a burn address. There is no contract credit, and so the ether is lost. Um, as an example, we can create a contract uh, by manually creating a transaction of the zero address with the contract and the data payload. Contract needs to be compiled into a bytecode representation. This can be done with the compiler. And then you can create a transaction. It's a good practice to uh, always specify a two parameter, even in the case of a zero address contract creation, because the cost of accidentally sending your ether to zero by zero and losing it forever is too great. You should also specify a gas price and gas limit. Once the contract is mined, we can then see it on a block explorer. So here we are showing creating the faucet.soul contract by manually creating a transaction to the zero address with the contract and the data payload. And then we're calling the compiler. So we're saying solidity compiler, uh, use the bi uh, in, in binary um, to faucet.soul. And here's the binary and so on. And then you can create the transaction for it uh, and specify, you know, from source to data is faucet code, gas, gas price, and so on. You always want to specify that two parameter, even in the case of zero address contract creation, so that you don't accidentally uh, send your ether to the wrong address and lose it forever. And here is using a block explorer to see that that contract was successfully mined. We've got our transaction hash. Uh, the, the status is successful. We show there's been a block confirmation. Did it about a minute ago. There's our two creating the contract. The value we sent in zero ether, the amount of gas, all the gas limit, the gas price, and then the actual transaction costs. And then it shows the input date. You can look at the receipt of the transaction to get information about the contract. Uh, this includes the address of the contract. Right here, we have this hash address for the contract, uh, which we can use to send funds to and receive funds from that contract. So if you're planning to send uh, or to communicate to that contract, you definitely want to get the contract address once you've deployed the contract. And I'll show you how you can do that in Remix uh, later on. Um, here's an example of two con transactions, the newly created contract using the address. We've got our contract address. Um, we're going to send a transaction to that contract address, uh, this address here, which is, again, 0BT26 is this address here that we just got when we deployed the contract. And then we're going to send another transaction, uh, again, to the contract address of 0BT26. Uh, we're sending uh, this particular data to call this particular function. Um, after a while, both of those transactions we just sent using our, our client will pop up in our block explorer and we can see all uh, the latest transactions. 
Um, and you can see these transactions here. All right, so we've just shown uh, some um, sending using creating some transactions for sending and receiving funds. Let's talk about digital signatures. I talked about digital signatures uh, previously in some of the lectures on cryptography, uh, but let's go into more detail about how exactly digital signatures are used in Ethereum to prove that you have the right to spend ETH, uh, whether you're sending ETH to someone else or you're sending ETH to a smart contract. So how are we using these, pro these digital signatures to present proof of the ownership of a private key without revealing the actual private key? Um, so just a reminder, a valid digital signature is essentially a mathematical scheme for presenting the authenticity of digital messages or documents. You know, it gives the recipient reason to believe the message was created by a sender and that the sender can't deny having sent the message and that the message wasn't altered in transit. Um, in Ethereum, we're using the digital signature algorithm, the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, uh, very similar to what's being used in Bitcoin. Because uh, again, if remember that uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin use almost identical uh, cryptography for the uh, public and private key. So the digital, and, and that's one and the reason why we do that is so we can use the same wallet standards. So the digital signature algorithm using Ethereum is ECDSA. Um, the digital signature serves three purposes in Ethereum. First, the signature proves that the owner of the private key, who is by implication the owner of an Ethereum account, has authorized the spending of ETH or execution of a contract. Secondly, it guarantees non-repudiation. The proof of authorization is undeniable. Third, it signature proves that transaction data has not been modified uh, and cannot be modified by anyone after the transaction has been signed. So again, how digital signatures work. Uh, digital signature is a mathematical scheme that consists of two parts. The first part is an algorithm for creating a signature, the using a private key, the signing key from a message, which in, in our case, the message is a transaction. The second case, uh, second part is an algorithm that allows anyone to verify the signature by only using the message and the public key, which anyone can get access to. So only the signer can sign it because only the signer has the private key, but anyone can use the public key to verify that the signer did in fact sign it. So in Ethereum's interpretation of ECDSA, the message being signed is a transaction or more accurately, it's a Kesek 256 hash of the encoded data from the transaction. The signing key is the uh, externally owned accounts private key. The result is a signature. So here's a, the uh, formula they're using. Um, over on the left side, we have our digital signature. Uh, in the middle, we've got our message M. Um, and so that message M is being hashed using uh, Kesek 256, which is, you know, pretty similar to SHA-256, but not quite. Um, so uh, we hash it using Kesek 256 and that plus K, the signing private key is then passed into the signing algorithm. So the message and the key gets passed into the signing algorithm and the result is a digital signature. Um, and the digital signature, again, remember we're using uh, elliptic curve cryptography, um, and that digital signature is gonna have two values, commonly referred to as R and S. Um, so we'll have these two values. And to verify the signature, you have to have the signature values R and S. You'd have to have the transaction and you have to have the public key to correspond. And so what you would do is uh, you use that public key and the transaction data and the signature and you can verify that the signer did in fact sign it. Uh, essentially verification of the signature means only the owner of the private key that generated this public key could have produced this signature on this transaction. So our signature verification algorithm takes the message, which is the hash of the transaction, the signer's public key, and the signature returns true if the signature is valid for this message and public key. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the signatures are created by a mathematical function and produces a signature composed of these two values, R and S. So I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail on this math, but I'll show you a little bit. Uh, essentially, the first thing it does 
is a signature algorithm first generates a temporary private key in a cryptographically secure way. This temporary key is used in the calculation of the RNS values to ensure that the sender's actual private key can't be calculated by attackers watching signed transactions on the Ethereum network. So this ephemeral private key is used to derive a corresponding uh, eph ephemeral public key. So we have a cryptographically secure uh, random number Q, which is used as our private key. And the corresponding public key, capital Q, generated from lower small case Q, and our elliptic curve generator point G. Uh, the R value of the digital signature is in the X coordinate of our eph ephemeral uh, public key Q. Once R is determined, the algorithm calculates the S value of the signature such that S equals Q inverse of uh, Kesek 256 of the message and R times K, all modulo P, where Q is eph ephemeral private key, R is our X coordinate of our ephemeral public key, K is assigning private key from the externally owned account, M is the transaction data, and P is a prime order of the elliptic curve. Uh, verification is the inverse of the signature generation function using the RNS values and the sender's public key to calculate a value Q, which is a point on the elliptic curve. The steps for verifying a digital signature, uh, first they check that all the inputs are publicly formed. Then they calculate W equals S inverse modulo P and calculate U1 equals the Kesek 256 of M times W modulo P. Then calculate U2 equals R times W modulo P. Finally, calculate the point on the elliptic curve uh, where we're going to calculate uh, Q for U1 times G plus U2 times K modulo P, where R and S are the signature values, K is the signer's public key, M is the transaction data, G is the elliptic curve generator point, and P is the prime order of the elliptic curve. If the X coordinate of the calculated point Q is equal to R, then the verifier can conclude the signature is valid. Note that in verifying the signature, the private key is neither known nor revealed. Because, you know, if we look up here, we're not actually using the private key to calculate the verification. So in practice, to sign a transaction, uh, the originator must digitally sign the message the, using the elliptic curve DSA. Uh, so when we say sign the transaction, we actually mean sign the Kesek 256 hash of the RLP serialized transaction data. The signature is applied to the hash of the transaction data, not the transaction itself. Um, so to sign a transaction, um, in Ethereum, the originator must, one, create a transaction data structure containing um, the various fields, the nonce, the gas price, gas limit, the two, the value, the data, the chain ID, and so on. Produce an RLP encoded serialized message of that transaction data structure. Go ahead and hash that serialized message using Kesek 256. Then compute the CDSA digital signature and then by and signing the hash with the originating externally owned accounts uh, private key. And then we append the signatures computed RS and B values to the transaction. So now you've got the transaction and you've got the digital signature appended to it. Uh, the special signature V indicates a couple things. It's a chain ID and a recovery identifier to help the ECDSA recover function check the signature. Um, and it also helps to indicate the parity of the Y component of the public key as to whether it's positive or negative. Uh, and it also helps prevent uh, replay attacks. Um, EIP, uh, Ethereum, you know, proposal 155 added some extra fields to the transaction data, the chain identifier and a couple other fields. Uh, these will change a transaction's hash to which the signature is later applied. Um, and that can prevent changes later on uh, if necessary, as well as preventing replay attacks. This was part of the Spurious uh, Dragon hard fork. Um, so here's a look at what the chain identifiers look like. Uh, we've got Ethereum mainnet identify well, for chain identifier one. We've got all the various uh, test nets like Robston, Wrinkleby, Rootstock, and Coven with their own chain links. Uh, we also have some Ethereum classics. 
Uh, main main, main uh, for Ethereum Classic is 61, testnet is 62, and we've got Geth private testnets, uh, you know, chain ID is like 1337 and so on. Um, let's talk about public key recovery. So I mentioned the transaction message doesn't include a from field. Once you have the public key though, you can compute the address uh, easily just using the normal algorithm for computing addresses from a public key. Um, and so the process of recovering the signer's public key is called public key recovery. Given the two values R and S that were computed in ECDSA math, we could compute two possible public keys. Uh, first, we compute two elliptic curve points from a coordinate uh, R and R apostrophe from the X coordinate R value that's a signature. We can also calculate R inverse, which is a multiplicative inverse of R. Finally, we calculate Z, which is the lowest bits of the message hash, where N is the order of the elliptic curve. And so our two possible public keys are then K1 equals R inverse SR minus ZG, and K2 equals R inverse SR apostrophe minus ZG. Um, and that's because the way elliptic curves work, uh, you're gonna have two potential values. To make things more efficient, the transaction the signature includes a prefix value of V, which tells us which of the two possible R values is the one we're interested in. Uh, if V is even, then R is the correct value. If V is odd, then it's R apostrophes. That way we need to only calculate one value of R and only one value for K. Let's talk about separate signing and transmission, uh, i.e. offline signing. Once a transaction is signed, it's ready to transmit to the Ethereum network. The three steps of creating, signing, and broadcasting a transaction normally happen in a single operation. For example, you're using a wallet, you click, you build your transaction to send some ETH to someone, you press send, and you expect it all to work. However, as you saw in, when we were talking about raw transaction creation and signing, you create a sign a transaction in multiple steps. Once you have a signed transaction, you could then transmit it later. Why would you want to separate the signing and uh, transmission of transactions? The most common reason is security. The computer that signs a transaction must have the unlocked private key loaded in memory. The computer that does the transmitting must be connected to the internet and be running an Ethereum client. If these two functions are on one computer, then you have private keys on an online system, which can be potentially vulnerable to hackers. Separating the functions of signing and transmitting and performing them on different machines or on an offline and online device is called offline signing and is a common uh, crypto security practice. Offline signing can be done in the following steps. Create an unsigned transaction on the online computer where the current state of the account, notably the current nonce and funds available can be retrieved. Transfer the unsigned transaction to an air gap device uh, for transaction signing uh, via QR code or USB flash drive. Transmit the signed transaction back to an online device for broadcast on the Ethereum blockchain via QR code or USB flash device. So here's a little diagram doing that. Uh, we show our online computers keeping track of the balances and talking to the Ethereum network. Then we have our offline signing uh, where we've got our offline computer that's doing the signing and it's getting the information from the online uh, computer via QR code or a USB device. Depending on the level of security need, your offline signing computer can have varying degrees of separation from the offline computer ranging from an isolated and firewalled uh, subnet, you know, online by segregated by firewall, to a completely offline system noted as an air gap system. Um, in an air gap system, there's no network connectivity at all. Computers separated from the online environment by gap of air. To sign transactions, you would need to transfer them to the air gap uh, computer using data storage me media, or better, a webcam and a QR code. Of course, this means you have to manually transfer every transaction you want signed, and that doesn't scale very well. While not many environments can utilize a full air gap system, even a small degree of isolation has significant uh, security benefits. For example, an isolated subnet 
uh, with a firewall that only allows a message queue protocol through can offer a much reduced attack surface and much higher security than signing on an online system. Many companies use a protocol such as zero MQ for this purpose. With a setup like that, transactions are serialized and queued for signing. The queuing protocol transmits the serialized message in a way similar to a TCP socket to the signing computer. The signing computer reads the serialized transaction from the queue, applies a signature with the appropriate key, and places it on the outgoing queue. The outgoing queue then transmits the signed transactions to a computer with an Ethereum client that dequeues the transactions and transmits them. The Ethereum network uses a flood routing protocol to send transactions uh, across the network. Uh, this is referred to as transaction propagation. Uh, each Ethereum client acts as a node in the peer-to-peer -peer Ethereum network, which uh, is intended to be a mesh network. No network node is special. They all act as equal peers. This is very similar to Bitcoin in that regards. Uh, we're going to use the term node to refer to an Ethereum client that is connected to and participated in the peer-to-peer -peer network. So transaction propagation uh, is going to start with the original Ethereum node creating or, or an assigned transaction or potentially receiving that transaction from an offline uh, creation source. The transaction is validated and then transmitted to all of the other uh, Ethereum nodes that are directly connected to the originating node. On average, each Ethereum node maintains connections to at least 13 other nodes, uh, which are referred to as its neighbors. And so each, each node will have a list of their neighbors. Each neighbor node will validate the transaction as soon as they receive it. If the neighbor node agrees that transaction is valid, it'll store a copy of the transaction and then propagate it to all their neighbors, except the one they received it from. As a result, the transaction will ripple across the, uh, the network away from the originating node, flooding across the network until all nodes in the network have a copy of the transaction. From the perspective of each node, um, it's not easy to tell where that transaction originally came from. Nodes can filter the messages they propagate, but the default is to propagate all valid transaction messages they receive. Uh, within just a few seconds, an Ethereum transaction can propagate to all the Ethereum nodes around the globe. Um, the neighbor that sent it to the node might be the originator of a transaction, or it might have been received from another neighbor. Uh, to be able to track the origins of transactions or interfere with propagation, an attacker would have to control a significant percentage of all the nodes. This is part of the security and privacy design of peer-to-peer -peer networks, especially as applied to blockchain networks. So, so let's talk about recording on the blockchain. While all the nodes in the Ethereum are equal peers, some of these nodes are operated by miners and are feeding transactions and blocks to mining farms, which are computers with high performance graphics processing units uh, for Ethereum. You know, different blockchains use different types of mining components. Uh, the primary uh, mining systems for Ethereum these days are running graphics processing units. Uh, the mining computers add transactions to a candidate block and attempt to find proof of work that makes the candidate block valid. Without going into too much detail, uh, valid transactions will eventually be included in a block of transactions and thus recorded in the Ethereum blockchain. Once mined into a block, transactions also modify the state of the Ethereum singleton, either by modifying the balance of an account, in the example of a payment, or by invoking contracts to change the internal state of a contract. These changes are recorded alongside the transaction in the form of a transaction receipt, which might also include events. A transaction has completed its journey from creation through signing by an externally owned account, propagation and finally mining has changed the state of the EVM singleton and left a mark on the blockchain. Let's talk about multi-signature or multi-sig transactions. So if you wa watched my uh, presentation on Bitcoin scripting capabilities, uh, you know it's possible to create a Bitcoin multi-signature uh, transaction, which can only spend funds when multiple parties sign the transaction. For example, uh, two parties uh, agreeing to that both have to sign or to spend funds, that would be a two of two, um, or if two parties out of three have to sign or to spend funds and so on, that'd be a two of three. Ethereum's basic 
uh, externally owned account va uh, value transactions don't have provisions for multi-signatures. However, you can create these sorts of signing restrictions using smart contracts, and you can put any conditions you want into a smart contract to handle the transfer of Ether and tokens and so on. To take advantage of this sort of multi-signature transaction capability, Ether has to be transferred to a wallet contract. That is uh, a contract that's programmed with the spending rules that are desired, such as multi-signature requirements or spending limits or some combination. The wallet contract then spend, sends the funds when prompted by an authorized externally owned account once the spending conditions have been satisfied. For example, to uh, protect your Ether, uh, you might, under a multi-sig condition, you might transfer the Ether to a multi-sig contract. Whenever you want to send funds to another account, all required users will need to send transactions to the contract using a wallet app, effectively authorizing the, the contract to perform the final transaction. These contracts can be designed to require multiple signatures before executing local code or to trigger other contracts. The security of the scheme is ultimately going to be determined by your multi-sig uh, smart contract code. So the ability to implement multi-signature tr transactions as part of a smart contract demonstrates some of the flexibility of Ethereum smart contracts. However, it is a double-edged sword as the extra flexibility can lead to bugs that undermine the security of multi-signature schemes. There are in fact a number of proposals to create a multi-signature command in the Ether Ethereum virtual machine that would remove the need for specialized smart contracts for multi-sig schemes. Uh, this would and it would end up being something equivalent to the way Bitcoin handles multi-sigs in that it would be part of the core consensus rules. Um, so in summary, transactions are a starting point for every activity in the Ethereum system. Transactions are the inputs that cause the Ethereum virtual machine to evaluate contracts, update balances, and more generally modify the state of the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, but we need to really dive in deeper to understand smart contracts, to really understand what's going on with transactions in the EVM. Uh, but basically, transactions are these digitally signed messages that originate from an externally owned account, uh, transmitted by the Ethereum network and recorded on the Ethereum blockchain. We talked about the fact that the transaction is essentially a serialized binary message that contains our nonce, our gas price, our gas limit. Uh, a recipient for the transaction, a value in a data field, and then our special values V, R, and S uh, for proving the uh, digital signature. Uh, we talked about the fact that gas is the fuel of Ethereum. Ethereum uses gas to control the amount of resources that a transaction can use. Uh, we talked about the fact that the nonce is a sequence number to prevent message replays and some other types of attacks. And we talked about the fact that the recipient of a transaction is specified in the two field, which is essentially an Ethereum address. Uh, could be a contract address or could be an externally owned account, which is, you know, a user's wallet address. Uh, we talked about the fact that the main payload of the transaction is the value in the data. Um, and your transaction could have either, both, or neither. Um, the value being the amount of ETH you're sending and the data being um, data you're sending to a contract. Uh, we talked about the fact that the digital signature is a mathematical scheme for proving that um, you had the authority to spend that Ethereum without having to reveal your private key. And we talked about the fact that the Steps of creating, signing, and broadcasting a transaction normally happens in a single operation when you're pressing the button on a wallet, but you could break it up into multiple steps, creating, signing, and broadcasting a transaction uh, as two or three separate steps. Uh, we also talked about the fact that the Ethereum network uses a flood routing protocol to send transactions to all the nodes. This is pretty similar to how Bitcoin does it. Uh, while all the nodes in Ethereum are equal peers, some of them are operated by miners and are feeding transactions and blocks to mining farms. We talked about the fact that valid transactions eventually get involved in a block of transactions and are recorded in the Ethereum blockchain, and that once mined into a block, transactions modify the state of the Ethereum singleton. Uh, we also talked about the fact that unlike in Bitcoin, um, if you want to implement multi-signature multi transactions in Ethereum, you need to do it using a smart contract. Um, and the smart contracts actually give you a great deal of uh, programmable capability, uh, which is far more flexible than what you can do in Bitcoin. And we're going to dive deeper into what you can do with smart contracts in future lectures that are part of the Understanding Crypto series. So thanks again for watching this lecture on understanding transactions in 
Ethereum. And tune in next time. We're going to dive deeper into smart contracts.